The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Tonight on The Agenda, John Michael McGrath and I with our weekly On Poly podcast. It's a very different political environment than it was uh, in 2021. That would be the guts of your play, wouldn't it, to go against the former sitting member? Right, and I mean, he could probably make himself a lot of fans in the current federal conservative party. Then... It's reducing the cost for commuters, but obviously someone has to pay for it. Um, so the province is paying that money then back to the transit, the transit systems, which as we know, desperately need that revenue. Hey, partner. This is a little bit different, eh? A little bit. A little bit. This is quite impressive. Well, before Teaching we... changes. David Bowie. Yes, indeed. There we go. <laughs> before we get into this episode, let's just ease into things, since this is our first video podcast. The On Poly podcast is now going to be part of the Agenda's Friday show, and it will also be on the TVO Today YouTube channel. So maybe we should just start by introducing our television audience to this thing that you and I have been doing already for the past four years or so. For those who have never heard of the On Poly podcast, how would you describe it? Uh, we are a uh, weekly, uh, somewhat nerdy uh, podcast about Ontario politics. I think a podcast about Ontario politics must, by definition, be by a bit definition, nerdy. Yes. Um, we usually break our show into uh, two or three segments uh, covering the sort of major issues of provincial politics that week. Uh, we would do more, but there's only so much time in the world, and uh, the, the podcast could go on forever. Yeah, we try to keep it to about a half an hour. And essentially, the format is three major issues of the week from Queen's Park, uh, from the week that was. We have other regular features as well that we like to drop in. Uh, for example, people can email us at onpolitics at tvo.org, onpolitics at tvo.org, and we answer questions and comments. We've got another feature called Your Column, My Column, in which you and I tell people about the columns that we wrote for the TVO website, tvo.org, the previous week, uh, because you and I do do other things here besides this podcast. I, I've seen some of it, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think and I've read a lot of your columns. So, uh, yeah, so th those are some other features. I and mean, sometimes we do something called the quote of note. If somebody says something particularly intriguing, we'll put that on as well. Yes, indeed. Uh, the main thing for uh, those members of our audience who are accustomed to just hearing the audio podcast, uh, you will still have that. Uh, for those of you who are uh, learning about us for the first time, some of you may have never seen me on TV before. <laughs> Uh, we are uh, super pleased to welcome you to our little show. Uh, and for those of you who have enjoyed listening to us and now want to see us as well, uh, we are going to accommodate you too. Uh, I'd like to think of it as a win-win-win situation, and that is not a reference to Ontario's 25th premier. You see, friends, that is the kind of side-splitting humor that we are renowned for on this podcast and that you can look forward to every week. Sort of. Anyways, shall we get to it? Let's get to it. And with that... Welcome, everyone, to the On Poly Podcast. I'm Steve Pakin. And I'm John Michael McGrath. Today on the pod, the Ontario Energy Board wants you to pay more for your natural gas. Energy Minister Todd Smith disagrees. Guess who won this fight? We're hearing rumors of a new omnibus bill that's headed to Queen's Park. And the Premier is dropping hints about a huge infrastructure project, perhaps the biggest in the world. What's that all about? It's Friday, February 16th, 2024, so let's get to it. Now, JMM, this is the part of the podcast where you and I usually off the top just do a little bit of small talk, uh, catch up on a couple of things from the past week. But given that we sort of already just did that, shall we just dive in? Uh, a logical conclusion, Mr. Spock. Yeah, that's another thing. We both like Star Trek a lot, so apologies in advance for the occasional reference. Um, before we get to our we three did call it a nerdy podcast. We did. So well, you, it's you did. What you it did. says on the tin. <laughs> live, live long and prosper, my friend. Live long and prosper. Live long and prosper. Now, before we get to our three issues, we always like to dive into the mailbag. gives uh, gives you a chance to give us some feedback, and uh, you can do that by emailing us at onpolitics at tvo org. So what have we got in the mailbag this week? Uh, this comes from Febrian Budiman uh, from Milton, Ontario, who asks, One comment and one question for the On Poly podcast. Under the new federal redistricting, there will be two Milton ridings. Mm -hmm. currently just one. Uh, so Parm Gill, who uh, we've talked about, uh, is, has resigned from provincial politics. Uh, he's going to run in one of uh, the two ridings should the federal election happen after April this year. But the other one is open for now. 
uh, on a related topic, a question. Will there be a redistricting in Ontario? The current map is mostly based on federal redistricting in effect since 2013. Now that there is a new federal map, when will Ontario adjust theirs? Okay, some good questions there. Let's do a little background and catch everybody up here. A couple of weeks ago, Progressive Conservative MPP Parm Gill resigned his position as the Minister of Red Tape Reduction to run federally for Pierre Polyev's Conservative Party of Canada. Since he was representing Milton in the Ontario legislature, it stands to reason that Mr. Gill will be running in one of those two federal ridings that you just referenced, Burlington Milton West or Georgetown Milton East. And one of those ridings will likely have Liberal MP and former Olympian Adam Vancouverden as the competition, since he is the current MP for the riding of Milton, federally, whereas the other riding will presumably have uh, just all newcomers with no former sitting member. So, does Parm Gill run against Vancouverden, who had more than 50% of the vote last time, or does he take a shot at the new riding? That is what he's got to figure out between now and the next election. Yes, and, and this is one of those cases where it'll, it'll be uh, revealing uh, what uh, the outcome is, what Parm Gill chooses. But uh, if he does choose to run against Vancouver, then I mean... Uh, he, as you say, he he won quite handily last time, but it's a very different political environment than it was uh, in 2021. That would be the guts of your play, wouldn't it, to go uh, against the former sitting member? Right, and I mean, he could probably make himself a lot of fans in the current federal Conservative Party if mm -hmm. he ended up uh, defeating uh, Van Coeverden. I, I know that uh, a lot of people... Uh, I mean, there's always acrimony between political parties. I think uh, a, a lot of conservatives would uh, uh, particularly enjoy uh, defeating Vancouver in, but that's just sort of general political acrimony. Yeah, who defeated Lisa Raitt the previous election. She was very popular. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Uh, Lisa Raitt, of course, has, has ruled out uh, running for uh, federal or provincial politics at the moment. Um, but uh, on the second question, the uh, federal redistricting, or rather, I should say the provincial redistricting one, uh, this is uh, something we, we know a little bit about. Um, historically, Ontario has followed the federal redistricting uh, ever since uh, 1999, when uh, Mike Harris introduced and passed the uh, Fewer Politicians Act, which uh, did what it said at the title. <laughs> um, it, it, it shrank the number of MPPs at Queen's Park. You know who the biggest casualty of that act was? Uh, please, do, do tell the audience. This is fun. Oh, you know. So you know, right? Well, you're talking about the premier's father. Exactly. Yes. Doug Ford's father whose name was also Doug Ford, when they went to fewer politicians, he lost his job. Yeah. Um, but uh, when the Liberals came into power in 2003, they uh, modified the plan slightly so that Ontario retains all of its northern seats. Those don't change no matter what happens federally. Um, it seems safe to say that the uh, current government is going to... Uh, probably follow the same script. Uh, when I asked uh, the Premier's office about this a few months back, uh, about whether they intended to preserve the Northern Ridings, they didn't want to commit to anything. They didn't give a, you know, a detailed answer uh, because this is legislation that has not been introduced or passed by the House yet, but they did say uh, that they, they always intend to, to protect the voice of Northern Ontario at the legislature. So uh, they have time to do this. Uh, it doesn't happen automatically. They do have to introduce legislation to change the makeup of uh, Queen's Park, uh, but they can do that at any time before 2026. While we're talking about Parm Gill, though, I mean, uh, he may have started a trend. There could be uh, more Ontario MPPs who are also looking for the exits and uh, may choose to jump to federal politics. There's a bunch of different reasons why uh, an MPP might do that. That's a, a more prominent job. And as you and I have talked about before on this podcast, uh, MPs and city councillors, but not MPPs, have mm -hmm. pensions. Uh, and, uh, you know, there are totally normal uh, household finance reasons why a person might seek uh, a political career at a different level. Federal MPs are paid much more than provincial MPs, and there is a pension federally, and there's no pension provincially. Thank Mike Harris for that. He got rid of the MPP's pension back in the 1990s. So there. Mike Harris comes up a lot. And, he does, uh, doesn't he? I, I, I believe uh, you've got a, a show about that. <laughs> that may very well be the case. Stay tuned to other episodes of The Agenda for that. Again, if you'd like to ask about the content on the show, please email us at onpolitics at tvo.org. Uh, make sure to include your first name, last name, and the city you live in. Now, on to issue one. 
Late last year, Ontario's Energy Minister Todd Smith said he would be introducing legislation to reverse a decision that the Ontario Energy Board had made on new homes and how they are heated. JMM, pick up the story if you would. Uh, really uh, bringing the audience in on the, the sexiest possible topic of energy regulation. <laughs> <laughs> um, it is always uh, odd when the government announces something when they send out a press release very late in December, uh, as this was. Uh, I was actually on vacation and I checked my inbox and there's this, this news release and you know, that almost never happens. Uh, the government was responding to a ruling from the Ontario Energy Board that said that uh, Enbridge, the gas utility in the province of Ontario, had to pay up front for new homes connected to the gas grid instead of amortizing the cost over decades, which is the, the normal practice or has been the normal practice so far. The uh, OEB's decision was based on uh, broadly the, the topic of the, the, the energy transition, as they call it, right? Homes using more electricity to power their cars and heat their homes instead of natural gas. Uh, the OEB basically said, like, we don't know how much longer this gas infrastructure is going to be useful for. So if we're going to build more of it, let's pay for it up front. Uh, in their decision, the OEB estimated that uh, the cost would be something like $4,400 per new home. Uh, that didn't sit well with the government. Uh, Energy Minister Todd Smith uh, announced that uh, he will be introducing legislation uh, basically as soon as the legislature returns later this month uh, to reverse this decision uh, specifically on the grounds that it will make uh, new homes more expensive. Now, Minister Smith said that reversing this decision would help keep shovels in the ground for home development, which, of course, this government is very hot on. Uh, but is whether you use a gas furnace or a heat pump really holding things up? You know, this is a, 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 the fair question, right? Uh, the, there is a trend towards uh, more electrification in homes. I mean, it, it's a bit of like everything old is new again, right? In the 50s and 60s, you saw campaigns for the all-electric home. Um, and now we're seeing a return to that, this time with things like heat pumps and electric cars. Um, Ontario, relative to other provinces, uh, could be, I think, fairly said to be lagging behind a bit uh, out of... a. Uh, uh, However many millions of homes we have in this province, only about 400,000 currently use heat pumps. Uh, those numbers are substantially higher in some other provinces. Uh, that said, incentivizing developers to choose heat pumps for new builds instead of using gas furnaces traditionally um, could be a way to build in more, uh, more efficiency in the new homes that we do build. Uh, the Environmental Commissioner of Ontario uh, positioned that since been folded into the Auditor General's office, uh, had criticized some of the current policies which uh, encourage new natural gas infrastructure, even in cases where uh, heat pumps would be more affordable. The cost of heat pumps, though, is still high. Um, some consumers are wary of them and whether they will work in a deep cold weather. Uh, say this for natural gas, but... Uh, a hot flame is pretty low tech and pretty reliable. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, you have to do things like uh, upgrade the electrical system in your house sometimes. So there are um, uh, reservations uh, about moving uh, to heat pumps for some people. So the situation of Energy Minister Todd Smith introducing legislation to rebuke a decision made by the Ontario Energy Board, how big a deal is that? It's not a small deal, certainly. Uh, I, I did speak with some environmental advocates who said, you know, quite aside from the substance of the decision, they, they really didn't like the sight of uh, what is supposed to be a professional arm's length regulator being overruled by uh, the provincial government basically on... on um, Broadly speaking, you, you, they're, they're being overruled by the political side of the government, and uh, they, that was, was concerning. Um, it's also clearly a case where the government is, is picking a side, right? They're picking natural gas over uh, a cleaner energy source. Um, you know, it could, in theory, be reversed by another government in time, uh, you know, after the, na the next election. This is uh, something I wrote for TVO.org. You know, this is not... Um, a huge decision in terms of its direct stakes, right? We're talking about a few thousand more homes that will be built between now and the next election that will be connected to the gas grid. That's out of an installed base of about 4 million homes uh, between Ontario and Quebec. So it's not... Uh, the end of the world, and, and, and we shouldn't, like, catastrophize it or, mm -hmm. or over-dramatize it. But it will pollute more. 
sorry it will pollute more but it will pollute more and and you know it will it will add to the margins and you know the margins can matter um and and the broader issue here is about the sustainability of our energy system overall and uh, how quickly or not so quickly we are transitioning to uh, cleaner systems okay with that on to issue two Now, sticking with housing, there's some reporting from the investigative online magazine The Narwhal that Ontario may be looking to expand its power to expropriate land. The so-called Get It Done Act could be introduced when the legislature returns. The Get It Done Act. I wonder where they got that line from. I I was going to say, you know, (laughs) this bill has not been presented to the legislature. You and I have not seen the text. We are going off of the Narwhal's reporting. Uh, But based on the title alone, I I find this a very credible report. (laughs) It sounds like it. Sounds like it. So what's it all about? Um, So this is, uh, again, from the Narwhal's reporting, uh, based on the idea that uh, in order to get uh, more housing built, we need to get more infrastructure built, right? You, You plug homes into things like roads and wires and and pipes, and that's uh, how we get homes built. And uh, one of the ways that you do that, uh, particularly for things like highways, is you expropriate the land, right? If you need to build a very big, long highway, you don't go and negotiate with every single landowner uh, on that route. The government just says, hi, we're taking your land, here's some money. Um, Now, there is a process to do that legally and fairly, and um, traditionally the government has to meet a test of, of, uh, it's it's called a hearing of necessity. Um, The government has already, with some of its transit projects, uh, dramatically scaled back that process and and made it much easier to prove necessity for uh, expropriation. They could now be doing uh, something like that for uh, new highway projects, including for uh, the more controversial one like the the Highway 413 in the Western GTA. Well, yeah. In fact, in a recent episode, we did mention that, uh, well, I think we were talking about the Greenbelt, actually, and we said that, you know, good process, as boring as that sounds, actually is really important when it comes to good governance. There are supposed to be checks and balances in place that prevent shenanigans from happening. Clearly, that did not appear to be the case in the Greenbelt uh, story. But the theory is good process leads to good governance, leads to good outcomes. And that's what we want at the end of the day. So what what is it about the current process that the current premier finds either too slow or too ineffective or whatever. Well, I mentioned those hearings of necessity. That is one uh, part of the process that uh, they, uh, as I said, they've they've already sped up for uh, transit uh, projects. Um, And there are other steps as well. Like, you you know, these kinds of large projects um, involve environmental assessments. Uh, There's obviously been some friction between the federal and provincial governments uh, over uh, whether the 413 would require a federal uh, impact assessment. uh, Province sure hopes not. (laughs) Well, exactly. Um, You know, the uh, province also has to uh, work with uh, other uh, expropriating and approval authorities. So that could be, uh, you know, municipalities. Um, And, uh, you know, they're all well-intentioned processes. They all were, you know, governments don't create hurdles for no reason. Um, they, they, they were all justified when we started doing these things, uh, in some cases, decades ago. Uh, the government is, I think, looking at these things with a, 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 let's call it a fresher eye, and saying, you know, actually, uh, this process that we implemented to keep a highway from getting bulldozed through somebody's neighborhood 50 years ago in that era of highway building, it, it doesn't need to, to pass the same test as uh, the highways we're building today. Now, of course, the government's critics would say, actually, yes, we still need to, to <laughs> pass those tests as well. So that's you know part of the argument. We actually did go through all this 50 years ago. It was called the Spadina Expressway, and a guy named Bill Davis stopped it uh, before it could in my view, rip its way right through a bunch of neighborhoods like Forest Hill and the Annex and go all the way down to the waterfront. And 50 years later, we're still arguing about whether that was the right decision. Uh, I think it was. Anything else about this story we should know? Uh, There are, uh, again, the Narwhal reports that uh, we can see changes to uh, urban boundaries. Now, this has been sort of... uh, uh, a flip flop and now potentially a re flip. <laughs> um, the government uh, last year expanded a bunch of urban boundaries throughout uh, the province, uh, allowing these cities to um, open up new lands for development, and in some cases, forcing them against their clearly expressed opinions uh, to um, uh, expand their, their urban boundaries. Uh, then, late last year, 
the government reversed that decision. Um, and now they are potentially uh, bringing those urban boundary expansions back. Now, I, you know, let's get let's get nerdy um, <laughs> for a change. For a change, uh, the the difference is, seems to be that whereas they previously used the minister's power, uh, like to executively uh, expand the urban boundaries, they would now do that with legislation. Um, there's a bunch of reasons why you might do that. Uh, one is that you can, with legislation, also say things like. Not only are we expanding urban boundaries, but all of the, the, the avenues that you normally have to appeal something like that don't apply. Um, the, the government can, using the legislature, short circuit a lot of those things. Um, we don't know that that's what they are going to do or why they are going to do that. As we say, we haven't seen the bill yet, but that's one reason why you might use the legislature instead of using the powers that the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, in this case, uh, Paul Calandra, already has. Um, the uh, government is also responding to uh, concerns from uh, indigenous community about uh, proposed changes. The Chiefs of Ontario and First Nations strongly opposed uh, Bill 23. This was uh, introduced uh, shortly after uh, the last election. It is called the More Homes Built Faster Act. It does not actually have seem to have gotten more homes built faster yet. <laughs> We're still working on that here kind in Ontario. Problem if that's what the act's called. Sorry? It's kind of a problem if that's what the act well, is yeah, called. Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, so uh, it, it, a number of Indigenous communities uh, had hoped for more consultation, more engagement uh, over uh, potential environmental harms uh, from Bill 23. There was another element uh, that uh, the Narwhal reported on that uh, caught my eye, uh, so-called special building zones, where uh, the province might take over local planning directly uh, for priority projects. Uh, you you could guess at a, a number of different ways they might use that. Uh, one thing we have talked about on the podcast before is Ontario Place, where uh, the province has made it very clear that they are just going to go ahead with that and their redevelopment of that land. And part of the new deal between uh, Ontario and Toronto that was announced uh, late last year is basically that um, uh, Mayor Olivia Chow is sort of stepping back and saying... Not my problem anymore. It's called Ontario Place, not Toronto Place. Exactly. That was her line. Um, so uh, that will be something I will be looking at very, very uh, closely when and if we see uh, a bill introduced like this. As we say, this is all still uh, in flux. We haven't seen a bill. We haven't seen the text of legislation. Um, we will have to see the entirety of the bill uh, before we can really um, uh, pick it apart and uh, judge it for our listeners. Soon. Absolutely. And with that, on to issue three. Well, there was a moment at a press conference a few weeks back that has been on your mind, JMM. The Premier was in Toronto delivering some remarks about expanding roads and highways, and he said this. That's just as we speak now, the $28 billion. Uh, we have a few other ideas up our sleeves that are, are going to really, really going to be incredible. Uh, we're thinking of a project that's going to be one of the largest projects in the world, but stay tuned for that one. That is a heck of a hint to drop. What do you think he's hinting at? I, I mean... We don't know. I asked the Premier's office if they would care to elaborate, and uh, as we record this, they have not responded. Um, there's a few things, though. Like, there's a few possibilities, a few broad categories. Let me uh, put it that way. Um, he was speaking at the Ontario Road Builders Association annual meeting, so that's, like, one clue. Maybe this is a highway project, right? Um, Ontario has some very large road projects underway already. Uh, my mind goes to the Gordie Howe Bridge down by Windsor, Detroit. Uh, that, now, that's a federal project, though there are substantial provincial uh, contributions to that. Now you know, can I just jump in? Yeah. I know you're not a sports fan, but do you know who Gordie Howe was? He was a hockey player, correct? He was a hockey player? <laughs> Before Wayne Gretzky, he was absolutely the greatest of all time. Uh, well, so just FYI. Our, our new audience members are going to have to learn that I'm absolutely <laughs> hopeless with sports this references. Is, this is why I raised it. And of course, the, 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 to me, this was the best thing Stephen Harper ever did was create this Gordie Howe bridge because it linked Detroit, where Gordie Howe played for almost all of his career, with Canada, where he's from. So it was a beautiful thing. Um 
so that is a... Boy, did I get us off the path there. But anyway, <laughs> get us back on the path. Uh, so that is one example of a major uh, infrastructure project, but it's already underway. So I don't think that's what the Premier is talking about. Uh, one thing that occurred to me, though, uh, we've talked about uh, transit already uh, in this uh, episode of the podcast. Uh, back in 2022... The Ministry of Transportation published uh, what they called the Long-Term Transportation Plan that included a sort of like wish list for all of the major projects the government was considering out until about 2050 or so. And that included some very big ideas that they said at the time uh, they were in the midst of doing, you know, substantial planning work for. Uh, one included uh, something they, they build as the Ontario Line Loop Extension, which um, if our uh, viewers and listeners know, the, the rough plan for the Ontario line is to start at the what is currently still the Ontario Science Centre, mm -hmm. go south down to sort of downtown Toronto and then turn west. Um, the idea of this loop extension would be to keep going west until you hit about Kipling, then go north to Pearson and then come back east and then go all the way across the top of the city and be this, this massive... Circular. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. a, a loop extension. Mm -hmm. um, now... I don't know that that's what the premier was referring to. Um, again, the premier's office did not uh, answer my questions. But um, it's the kind of idea, it's, it's the scale that would be one of the biggest projects in the world as the premier built it. Um, it would, yeah, it, it would be truly, truly massive. And, and like that's in the context of a... A, a transportation building uh, spree that this government is on that is already quite large. And, and not only that, I mean, that would presumably take decades to complete. I mean, that's something that that our kids might not... My, our kids might be grandparents before that thing were ever done. I, I think it's fair to say that if the Premier announces this, he will not be the one to get it done. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you're right, this takes... Stay tuned to a new level. Uh, the Ontario line itself uh, has barely begun construction. The Premier is already previewing an extension that won't start construction for years or even decades. Is that right? Well, if I'm right, then yes, uh, that would be uh, basically the sum of it. But, you know, we could also, uh, it's, it's the On Poly, the politics podcast, so I will make a political point here. Um, we know that the progressive conservative government and, and the PC party uh, have done pretty well by emphasizing to voters their desire to build and keep building. And so let's go over that route one more time, right? It would almost perfectly go through ridings that are currently held by the PC party. Oh, you're so cynical. Oh, uh, it's, it's a disease. I, I, I apologize already. Um, now, it might be a perfectly defensible transit project. And in fact, you know, I think it, it could very well be. I think it, like, and I'm biased towards spending money on public transit anyway. Um, but the political map and the transit planning map uh, sometimes align in funny ways, and that is something I would say is not true uh, only about this government. <laughs> well, since you mention it, I well remember Bob Ray's government back in the early 1990s deciding to create a subway line under Eglinton Avenue, right near our station here. And when Mike Harris came into power in 1995, he cancelled it, in part, he said we couldn't afford it, but I've always been suspicious about that. I always felt, as you talk about transit maps overlapping with political maps, do you know who's riding that Eglinton line was going to end up in on the West End? With that Bob, Bob Ray's. <laughs> there you go. So that might have had something to do with it as well. Anyway, is that it for us? I uh, believe so. We I think that's it for us. That is the On Poly Podcast for this February 16th, 2024. You can follow our show on Apple Podcasts so that you get notified each time a new episode is available. And if you already follow our show, help a friend follow it too. You can also see our podcast conversation on television every Friday night at 8 and 11 Eastern as the first half of the agenda. And it's also available on the TVO Today YouTube channel. Any feedback you have, we're happy to hear it, good, bad, or indifferent. Write us an email at onpolitics at tvo.org. Make sure you include your first and last name and where you're located, because we'd love to give you credit. Until next Friday, everybody, bye-bye. See you soon.
Later this month, commuters in the GTHA will see, and some would say finally see, fare integration come fully into effect. It allows riders to transfer seamlessly among TTC, Go Transit, and other transit agencies. And it's just one of the stories that Lex Harvey is following for the Toronto Star, where she is a transportation reporter. And she joins us now. Welcome. Yeah, thank you for having me. All right, as mentioned, one fare, or the integrated transit fare system, comes into wider effect later this month. What is it? Yeah, so it's a pretty big deal. It essentially means that commuters who are coming into Toronto using the TTC can transfer from, an, from another municipal system without paying that double fare, as well as commuters who are using a GO train as well as the TTC can then deduct the price of the TTC from their GO train fare. All right, so let's do some examples so we can okay. understand how it works. We'll do one that's pretty easy. Uh, let's say we are getting on the TTC and we're transferring to the GO train at Union and say perhaps we're going to Hamilton. Do you still have to pay for a GO ride or what would that look like? Yes, yeah, so you still have to pay for your GO ride, but that ticket will be then minus the amount that you already paid for the TTC. So you're not then paying for the TTC on top of the GO transit fare, which is obviously more expensive. All right, so for, for example, at TTC, it's 335, you deduct that off of your Hamilton GO ride. Exactly. All right, how does it work, let's say, if you are in Brampton starting your trip and you are heading to Toronto, I believe in Brampton it's $4.50 and heading into Toronto, and then does that look different on your commute back? So as far as I understand it, I think it's quite similar to if you were to ride the subway on the TTC and then get off and get on a streetcar right away, where you maybe tap your presto um, or you give that transfer, but you're not paying again. So this is how it would work with other municipal systems, um, assuming that you are paying with, I believe, a credit or a debit card or with that presto card. All right, let's talk a little bit uh, about a little more money, actually. So the province is uh, saying that riders could save $1,600 a year on average. Now, is this real savings, as in it's reducing the actual cost, or is this a subsidy from the province? So it's reducing the cost for commuters, but obviously someone has to pay for it. Um, so the province is paying that money then back to the transit state the transit systems, which as we know, desperately need that revenue. So I believe it's gonna cost about $117 million annually is what the province is estimating for this program. All right, is this just really good retail politics or is this in your eyes a good way to subsidize transit? Obviously this is something that particularly here in this city, a lot of people have been waiting for, but is this perhaps the answer to subsidizing transit? I mean, I think it's a really smart idea. It's something that business organizations, uh, the Toronto Board of Trade has been advocating for this for a long time. Um, I know that TTC riders and other advocacy organizations have been advocating for this. Um, I mean, it's gonna save quite a lot of money, $1,600 a year for the average commuter coming into Toronto from the GTA or other regional systems. And we need to really be incentivizing people to use transit. Obviously our transit agencies have been struggling to recoup that ridership since the pandemic. And as we look towards a future, we desperately need to get uh, people off the roads in their cars. We have a really big problem with congestion in this city, as well as looking towards meeting our climate goals. A big part of that will be incentivizing people to use transit and other forms of active transportation. All right, let's talk about a specific part of this city, uh, Scarborough. Um, the long debated subway extension is still many years away, but the RT derailed in July, forcing the issue. Do we have any updates what's happening there right now? Sure, so we have had some good news okay. for Scarborough Transit riders, finally. Um, so the mayor has announced that her budget will fund the Scarborough busway, which has been determined as kind of the best interim solution while transit riders there wait for the subway extension. Basically, it means that they're converting the old RT route into a designated right of way for the bus so that it just goes a lot faster. Um, but that said, <laughs> we're still, I mean, no transit project uh, in this province goes off without a hitch. Right. So <laughs> we're definitely still a few years away from that. They're hoping that construction will start in 2025 and we're looking at at least about two years for that. All right, and then do we have any realistic date for when commuters can expect sort of Scarborough kind of returning back to normal with, a, with an RT? Um, so we have a subway extension that's right, being sorry, built. Yeah, yeah, so that'll look a bit different. I think that the estimated date for that now is about 2030. 
Um, but if, I mean, I don't want to be skeptical, uh, <laughs> when the busway is built in 2027, I've heard from commuters that that will be really helpful, um, probably saving about 10 minutes each way, which really adds up if you are transferring in between a lot of different uh, modes of of transit. So people are really looking forward to that. Obviously, it's still quite a few years away. And at this point, I think people are upset that it wasn't put in place sooner. Right. Um, while no one expected the RT to derail, it was already set to be decommissioned in November. And so I think fairly riders are wondering why there wasn't a better plan in place. How much of your reporting uh, involved in this kind of story actually involves is it aging infrastructure or is it sort of urgent need in terms of sort of the subway extension? Right. I think, I mean, I think there's a lot of things at play here. Um, the TTC has many different issues right now. One of the big problems they're facing is just this growing state of good repair backlog. Um, the RT was 10 years right. past its sort of best before date when it derailed, and it's definitely not the only piece of infrastructure that's in that condition. We know that the Line 2 subway trains are just a few years from that best before date, and then beyond that, that means spending more money to then keep them alive for longer to inevitably replace them. So that is a big part of it, but also I think just building transit and having um, having these routes in place for people that need it most. Is this, uh, in particular with this project, is it about money or is it bad planning? Is it sort of, what are the sort of the other challenges or obstacles here? Yeah, um, I mean, when you're talking about transit in Scarborough, this is something that politicians have debated for literally decades, what will replace this Scarborough RT. Um, at one point it was going to be an LRT, and then there was subway, and, and we kind of saw the situation of successive governments coming in, pitching ideas, and then that idea getting scrapped and essentially just ending up in the situation where we are at now, where there is nothing. Um, with the busway, I know that Mayor Olivia Chow came in promising to fund it, promising to provide that good alternative for Scarborough transit riders. For a while, we weren't sure where that funding was going to come from. So a lot of re my reporting was revolving around that. I know she hoped that the province might uh, foot the bill for that, but that money did come with the latest city budget. All right, as you know, we are situated here at Young and Eglinton. Yes. There are several LRT uh, light rail transit projects underway, obviously, as we know, they don't necessarily meet uh, deadlines here. Uh, any updates on those, also including those in the Finch area and Brampton and Mississauga? Yeah, so um, I guess starting with Brampton and Mississauga, good news. The Ford government has basically directed Metrolinx to look into mm -hmm. expanding the forthcoming Hazel McCallion LRT into downtown Mississauga and Brampton. So that's one piece mm -hmm. of good news for transit riders. Obviously the Eglinton Crosstown LRT is probably the number one thing on a lot of people's <laughs> minds. Mm -hmm. um, it's been hugely disruptive for local residents to go through so much construction. And while things seem to be progressing, we still don't have an opening date. Metrolink CEO Phil Verster has kind of repeatedly said that he has a good idea of when it's gonna open, but he's not gonna tell us but he will give us that heads up three months in advance of it opening. Okay. One thing I can say is that, I guess a bit of a hint here, is in the TTC budget, they are planning that it will open in September along with the Finch LRT, but of course noting that those dates may change. All right, we'll, write it, we'll mark it in the calendar, but we know that it might change. Yeah. All right, uh, back in January, uh, you wrote about something I think will have many people surprised who take the TTC, uh, particularly TTC buses. They are being used uh, for something quite different than transit. Tell us a little bit about that. Sure, so I think as we all know, we are in the midst of a incredible housing crisis. Um, we also have a very big crisis around homelessness and around a lack of capacity in our shelters. So one of the solutions that the city and the TTC have floated is that they will have these shelter buses that sit outside Spadina Station this winter. I think there's about up to six of them. Mm. Um, and the idea from the beginning was that these buses would then transport people 
on the subway system late at night to shelter beds. But what has really happened um, in actuality is that we don't have space in our shelters. So they have kind of served as these de facto shelters um, and they have heating on them, but they basically just stay still outside of the station and, and they're maybe a warm place for people to spend the night. In terms of resourcing for that, uh my understanding is TTC operators are actually sort of the the primary people on board. Are they getting any training for, for sort of dealing with any crisis? Certainly not enough. I've spoken to TTC operators who are very compassionate and concerned about this situation. But essentially, we're seeing this broader homelessness crisis that's been thrust onto the people, of, the people who operate our transit system who didn't really sign up for this. Again, don't have the training. They're not social workers. They aren't equipped to respond to these types of situations. All right. Last time we had you on the program, we were talking about uh, violence on the TTC as well. Uh, this time last year, there was a growing concern about violence on the TTC. Any updates on that? I'm hoping some positive news. Yeah, I think things are, are trending in the right direction. It's definitely been um, I guess I feel like the issue has been less in the forefront than it was at this time last year. From a data perspective, we have seen those metrics that the TTC tracks, like these violent incidents against customers go down. And I know that the TTC and the city have been really focused on adding more frontline TTC customer service type staff to the system. That's something that Ryder said makes them feel a lot more comfortable. But I think beyond that, when we looked at the issue of violence last year, one of the big things that we spoke about were just all of these underlying social issues right. in the city. So, you know, be it the housing crisis, be it the lack of support for people struggling with mental health crises, be it the affordability crisis. And I would say that those things all still very much exist. All right, we have about a minute left. I do want to ask you a question. I don't know if it's just me. Okay, you know, I'll admit, it's not just me. I hear this from my colleagues, I hear this from friends, but it feels like the TTC is slowing down. What is the holdup? It is not in your head. <laughs> <laughs> Having written line one to get to the TVO studio this morning, it is very slow. Um, so the TTC is operating these reduced speed zones right now, which are taking up a lot of line one. And also there's a couple areas of line two that are uh, under this protocol, which essentially means the trains are moving about half as fast as they would be under normal conditions. The reason for this, I'm told, is that they conducted this track review and found there were areas in need of repairs. And in, in order to ease the stress on the tracks while they work to fix these things, they are having the trains run more slowly. All right. So maybe a bit disconcerting. Sorry. I'm told this is regular, but the impact is huge, of course, because not only is your train running slower, but if you have multiple subways running at this reduced speed, it does create kind of a backlog, which is probably why it's taking so long to get around. I was going to say, I'm sure commuters are unfortunately used to some of these uh, disruptions, but okay. a lot of great updates and great news on the way. So thank you so much, Lex. Thank you for having me. We all remember back in May of 2023, Doug Ford, Premier Doug Ford, pledging to introduce the so-called Hazel McCallion Act, which would have allowed Mississauga to leave Peel Region, uh, of which it has been a significant constituent part for going on 50 years. But then several months later, in December of 2023, Doug Ford backtracked on the Peel dissolution plan, and Peel stays as is for the moment. Okay, let's go in inverse order this time. Martin, he's made two different decisions here. Which was the right decision? Hmm. Oh, that's a trick question. <laughs> I, I think the pattern is that they were, they were both flip-flops. I think they were both poorly thought through. So I'm not sure what the absolutely right decision is. I think the politics is what was driving the decisions on this one as, as, as with the green belt. If you asked Hazel McCallion, it was an obvious decision. There was an imbalance for taxpayers, et cetera. If you asked Bonnie Crombie, the former, the then mayor, now liberal leader, again, Patrick Brown, mayor of Mississauga. Mayor Brampton. Uh, uh, thank you, not Steve <laughs> Clark. Mayor, <laughs> Ma Patrick Brown, mayor of Brampton. I'm never gonna Brampton. this down. <laughs> and, and so, uh, and if you asked the mayor of Caledon, she supported this mm -hmm. back at the beginning and then changed her mind. She's now opposed to it. So, so sometimes there isn't an obvious decision and, and to govern is to choose. 
I don't pretend to be an expert, so I'm not going to choose, but I'm going to analyze what or, or argue what I think was not the right choice, which was to do this for political reasons and to take the path of least resistance. I guess Doug Ford finally had to acquiesce to Hazel McCallion, deathbed promise to her, went ahead and did it, thought that Bonnie Crombie, or perhaps hoped that Bonnie Crombie would remain as mayor of Mississauga once he gave her this gift. And then when she ran to be liberal leader and potentially will harvest all those Mississauga seats, now there's no upside for Doug Ford anymore. There's losing those seats anyway, and there's the downside of having Brampton mad as heck at him. Mm. And so I think that is the where I land on this, is it's, you have three former and present provincial party leaders, right? Patrick Brown, former conservative leader, Doug Ford, the current, don't like each other much. Doug Ford and Bonnie Crombie don't like each other much. All that triangulation, all that bad blood, and a divorce. Doug Ford does seem to have an amazing superpower, which mm -hmm. is to say he can go out there and step in three feet of manure <laughs> and get it all over him and then come out before the cameras and really emote, apologize, and his polling numbers go right back up. Mm -hmm. As they used to say on television in the 50s and 60s, explain, Lucy. <laughs> <laughs> I won't hit you over the head with a rolling pin after <laughs> I do you. it. Um, it. It is remarkable, and I think it is actually his superpower, and it is rare, because he seems to be able to act as almost a spectator on his government sometimes. It's like, hey, Premier, what do you think about your government wasting... Oh, that sounds awful. I can't believe I'm going to get to the bottom of it. It's like, no, man, you're in charge. Like, how, how can you possibly... But he has... I think being able to consistently kind of paint himself as an outsider, I'm not part of this machine. I think the longer he goes in government, I think the less that ability um, remains. But yeah, he does have a Teflon-like ability to stand back and say, you know what? That was the wrong thing to do. I'm super sorry. Like, aw shucks, folks, let's move along. Mm -hmm. And he's kept that. Uh, there are... I've actually never seen a politician be able to do it as effectively as he has. Or as many times. Or as many times. Mm -hmm. But I also do think that in politics, and particularly all of us as kind of almost like sports fanatics watching the, the thrust and, and parry of this, um, we really obsess over flip-flopping or changing your mind. I think most people in the country, most voters, are accept that that's part of life. And if you have facts in front of you that negate, like that maintain that, then you can. So I think people care less about flip-flops than all of us do, yeah. which is also why he's able to do it. How infuriated are New Democrats at being, <laughs> once again, watching the Premier do this over and over and over, seemingly successfully? Oh, look, there's a couple of parts to this. You expect the Premier to do this at some point. You're just like, okay, this is, you know, the usual, the usual thing. What I've actually been really quite encouraged by has been watching the New Democrats, in particular, Mart Styles, being out there talking about the closures at in Minden and the, in the emergency room, going. She just did a Northern Ontario tour, going into the mines, talking to people on the ground. What's happening? She is also promoting really interesting women-led businesses. There's a, a coverall manufacturer in Northern Ontario that makes it specifically for women. And, you know, again, women in trade, something Minister McNaughton was quite good at talking about, but the rest of this government not so much. So. It gives you, if you're, if you're an opposition leader and the leader of the opposition, you're going to go out and say, he is, here is what they are doing. They are not going to fulfill any of these promises and these aw shucks. We're not getting the housing built. We're not getting the emergency departments up and operational. You're still waiting months and months and months, no matter how much gobsmacking amounts of money in, are in the Ministry of Health, you're still not getting your hip replaced nearly as fast as you should be. Those are the things that if you're an opposition leader two years out from, from, uh, from the next election, you're building up that database, you're finding those candidates. The key is to address the emissions associated with the, with the use of natural gas. And as we see natural gas increasingly complementing uh, renewables on the system and potentially replacing the use of um, gas and oil and transportation and in home heating, you have the ability to move to a lower carbon footprint. We really need to focus on what is the most cost-effective way to reduce emissions while giving Ontarians what they've always been used to, a reliable and resilient energy grid. Can you lower emissions? Can you lower emissions and, and use less natural gas? So, yes, um, you, I think 
some of the technologies we've talked about today. There's been studies in Ontario that look at the ability for energy efficiency, for example, to meet 20% of Ontario's energy needs. Like the cheapest power plant is the one you don't have to build. And we're living in the digital era where you can really help avoid the electricity system gets built out for the hottest day in Ontario or the coldest day in Quebec. Mm -hmm. How do you just make those days less intense? When you're using heat pumps in households, those are more efficient than air conditioners, you know, like other energy efficiency measures. Battery technology has come down 80% in the last 10 years and projected to continue to decline over the course of the next 10 years. So these, those kinds of technologies are going to help balance out some of the renewables on the grid even more than they have done so in the past. Um, in addition to uh, distributed energy resources, the electric cars that people have in their driveway being able to kind of power homes overnight. Again, another study looked at the ability for Ontario to meet 100% of its incremental needs based on distributed energy resources like that, like uh, solar rooftops. The challenge is human. So how do we create the innovation, the market structures, the design to allow for a culture of innovation and build in kind of that first instinct to try to look at some of these new non-emitting solutions? You heard in my intro, I'm not suggesting that natural gas won't have a transitional role in a very short-term period, but the challenge is these plants last for a very long time. Like a transitional period isn't 40 years we're gonna be sitting in the status quo. What we need it? to be planning for it today. So transitional period would be how long? Well, I think, you know, people are probably aware that the federal government is talking about a 2035 clean electricity regulations. I think they are creating within the structure of what they first published an ability for natural gas to be used as a peaker. So that's that thing we're talking about like on those very off days that you might still need it, you might still need to do that in 2035. But I mean, the ISO, the system operator, operator in Ontario said they could see a natural gas moratorium being feasible as of 2027. Like we're not talking about long timelines here. We need to be starting to move to the future and figuring out that transition plan today. Just on the issue of emissions though, is it possible to continue to use natural gas the way we have been and reduce the emissions? Maybe we burn cleaner, I don't know, you tell me. So the goal is not just to reduce emissions. Yes, we can reduce emissions. Uh, that's possible. We could have more efficient plants. We could have more efficient homes. We can blend in some renewable natural gas, perhaps maybe some hydrogen. But the goal is in the electricity sector is to get to net zero emissions by 2035. This is what Canada's goal is as articulated by the prime minister. This is what the goal is across Europe and in many, many countries. In a nutshell, I'd say a chronic uh, or years of chronic underfunding. Uh, and this isn't new, this is uh, many governments. I think the last major investment in post-secondary education came after the Ray Review, uh, which was uh, in the McGuinty era, 2004, 2005. Uh, then that was cut back. Uh, tuitions have been cut back, 2019, 10%, frozen ever since. Uh, it goes on and on. Operating grants, if you look at funding formulas, uh, the amount that they recognize that programs need to be funding, frozen for at least 15 years. Mm. Uh, so I think it's just a case of years and years, chronic underfunding, lack of recognition of what the system needs, and we are where we are. Jeff, what would you add to that list? Yeah, just Steve, that we've gone through a period of hyperinflation now, and like everyone else, the the forces on our delivery of education, it costs more to educate Ontarians and educate students. And of course, there hasn't been any response in the in the amount of support that we've received from government. Well, okay, let me try this then, Alex. I remember covering Queen's Park in the early 1980s, and people were protesting at Queen's Park because even under the sainted Bill Davis government, post-secondary education funding per student was 10th out of 10 provinces then. It's 10th out of 10 provinces today. Has all that much really changed? Uh, <clears throat> underfunding higher education in Ontario is a thoroughly pan-partisan affair. Um, <laughs> in the 40 years since, since you covered that in, with Bill Davis, I think there were only two years during the McGuinty period when uh, Ontario climbed up into ninth place. Um, for Ontario to reach ninth place now, would take $4 billion a year. And to reach the actual, the national average, or the average of the other nine provinces, would take about $7 billion a year. Hmm. That's how badly it's underfunded in this province compared to the rest of Canada. And the obvious conclusion I'm drawing from that is, we're not about to see $4 billion injected into the system this year. Not that I've heard. <laughs> <laughs> so we are where we are. Yeah. We have about 10 in Toronto right now, uh, and about five of them are actually in the in the area near St. Michael's Hospital where I work. Uh, and 
uh, they're incredibly important for saving lives. How come? Because uh, we've talked a lot about the toxic d drug supply, and I said nobody I know uh, that we see in our emergency departments intentionally overdose. And they want to use, when they're using drugs, they want to use them safely. And so a safe consumption site allows them to come in and do it in a supervised manner. And should they be taking a drug that actually has one of the toxic uh, add add additions to it, mm -hmm. then they can be uh, cared for by people who are trained. And they are also there supported by peer uh, outreach workers and a community where they can uh, ensure that the right resources are in place to help people who are managing addictions. Jennifer, do we have any sites in Belleville? We don't. We have zero sites in Belleville. Do you need some? Absolutely, we do. <laughs> um, I mean, that's definitely something that we would push for. Um, what we've been told in the past is that there's there's quite a bit of red tape to get through to um, be able to, ha to have a site. Um, but I think a lot of our, our immediate issue would be solved um, with that type of support in place. I'm sure there are people watching us or listening to us right now who think that if you have safe injection sites that are administered the way that Carolyn just described them, you are still enabling dangerous and harmful behavior. What would you say to those folks? People use for all types of different reasons, um, and they're going to use regardless of what people think of that. And so if, at least if they're using in a place where it's safe and um, they have support to help them, it's better than using on the street where people are they're dying. Um, right now, you know, we have staff constantly out checking on, on our guests uh, just to make sure everybody's okay. Um, but that's an added stressor on the staff to be constantly vigilant, um, making sure our citizens are okay. Coming up Tuesday on The Agenda, for 25 years, we've had homelessness in this country and we allowed it to exist. This is not a new issue. This has been slowly building for 30 or 40 years in this country. And, and a lot of people, all of us, um, sat back and watched it grow. And now we, we, now we say it's a crisis um, to the point where we can't build housing fast enough. In fact, we're losing more affordable housing than we're building right now, no matter how much money we put into it. That's Tuesday on The Agenda.